Okay, go ahead and put the next slide up, please. You are invited to participate in our transportation planning process, regardless of your race, color, national origin, including limited English proficiency, religion, creed, gender, ancestry, ethnicity, disability, age, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, veteran status or background. To read the full notice of your rights and protections, go to www.bostonmpo.org slash mpo underscore non underscore d-i-s-c-r-i-m-i-n-a-t-i-o-n. All participants will join the meeting with muted microphones. Please rename yourself to include your first name, last name, and affiliation. After roll call, board members may mute and unmute themselves. Always remain muted unless actively speaking. To participate in the discussion, please select the raise hand function. Find this by clicking either at the participants button at the bottom of the screen, and a window will pop up with a raise hand button at the bottom, or the reactions button in the toolbar. The chair will then call on participants. If you are on the phone, you can use star nine to raise your hand. If you have any technical difficulties, please contact Betsy Harvey via the chat box or at e-h-a-r-v-e-y at ctps.org or 857-702-3701. This meeting is accessible to people with disabilities. Zoom products are compliant with exceptions with the following standards. Web Content Accessibility Guidelines 2.1 Level AA standards and revised section 508 standards. If you require any additional accommodations in order to participate fully in this meeting, please contact Betsy Harvey of the MPO staff at e-h-a-r-v-e-y at ctps.org or 857-702-3701. First item on the agenda is introductions. I'm David Muller, I'm Secretary Fiendaka here. Jonathan, please call the roll. Matthew, sure. The Matthew TC two. Not seeing John or Marie yet. Okay, thank you. Uh, Matthew T Highway Division. John Romano Hamp. Thank you. Uh, MBTA. Good morning. This is Allie Clayman representing Interim General Manager Jeff Gonville in the MBTA. Thank you, uh, Massachusetts Port Authority. Hi, good morning. This is Sarah Lee representing Massport. Thank you. Uh, MAPC Vice Chair. Good morning, Eric Barrasso with the Metropolitan Area Planning Council. Thank you. Uh, MBTA Advisory Board. Brian Kane, MBTA Advisory Board. Good morning, all. Thank you. Uh, Regional Transportation Advisory Council. Leonard Dickens Advisory Council here. Thank you. City of Boston, BTD. Not seeing Will Conroy or Jen Rowe yet. Okay. Uh, City of Boston, BPDA. No Jim or Joe. Okay. Uh, at large, City of Everett. I think I see Eric. Eric Molinari uh, sitting in for Jay Monty representing uh, Mayor Carlo Di Maria in the city of Everett. Thank you. Uh, at large, city of Newton. Good morning. David Kozis representing Mayor Ruth Ann Fuller in the city of Newton. Thank you. Uh, at large, town of Arlington. Not seeing Claire Ricker. Okay. At large, town of Brookline. Good morning, Rob King, representing Charles Carey, Town Administrator, and Heather Hamilton, Select Board Chair for the Town of Brookline. Thank you. Intercore Committee, City of Somerville. Oh, I don't think we can hear you, Tom. I think it might be a audio issue on your end, Tom, but I, I do see you. So I will I will say Tom Ben is here uh, for the Unicor Committee. Uh, Minuteman Advisory Group on Interlocal Coordination. Good morning, Austin Seguinos, Town of Acton, representing the Magic Subregion. 
Thank you. Uh, Metro West Regional Collaborative, City of Framingham. Dennis Chiambetti, representing Metro West Region in, in Mayo City, Framingham. Thank you. Uh, North Shore Task Force, City of Beverly. Darlene Wynn, representing the North, North Shore Task Force and Mayor Cahill. Thank you. Uh, North Suburban Planning Council, uh, Town of Burlington. Not seeing Melissa. Okay. South Shore Coalition, Town of Hull. Jennifer Constable, Town of Hull for the South Shore Coalition. Thank you. Southwest Advisory Planning Committee, Town of Medway. Not seeing Peter yet. Okay. Three Rivers in a local council, Town of Norwood, Neponset River Regional uh, Chamber. Uh, good morning. Tom O'Rourke from the Town of Norwood representing the Trek sub region. Great. Thank you. Um, I do see um, uh, Lyris. Uh, I believe you're representing the Mass.C2. Uh, if you could unmute her, uh, please. Yes. Good morning, Lee Sluto. I am um, representing Deputy Chief Engineer of Project Development, John Bouchard. Master Highway Division. Thank you very much. Um, I do see City of Boston, BTD. Can you unmute William Conroy, please? Bill Conroy, representing Mayor Wu in the City of Boston. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I believe um, any other MPO members that have, oh, Jim, uh, Jim, uh, City of Boston, BPDA? Not seeing either of them yet. I see uh, Jim Fitzgerald, um, it's it's written as Fitzgerald. Uh, thank you, Jim Fitzgerald with BPDA representing uh, Mayor Wu in the City of Boston. Thank you. Uh, move on to our ex officio members, Federal Highway Administration. Good morning, Ken Miller, Federal Highway. Thank you. Uh, and Federal Transit Administration? That calls the roll, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jonathan. Next item on the agenda is Chair's report. I don't have one, so we'll go directly to Taken's Executive Director's report. Taken, when you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and welcome, everybody. Um, before I get into the slides um, that I usually have to provide um, background for the updates, I am thrilled to report that the Safe Streets and Roads for All Grant Awards were announced by USDOT, and the Boston Region MPO has been awarded um, $2.23 million in federal funding for the development of a safety action plan for the Boston Region. And we are doing this with the goal of eliminating traffic fatalities and serious injuries in our region. So I wanted to say many, many thanks to MAPC and MassDOT as part of this effort. MAPC is the fiduciary agent to the staff of the MPO, was the applicant on behalf of the MPO, and we worked closely together on the application. And MassDOT committed to providing the matching funding, bringing the total of the grant amount to 2.7 million. So we um, as staff, and I hope you all as a board, are looking forward to working with our local, state, and regional partners to carry out this work. Um, that said, note that we've been told it can take some time to receive the funding, um, perhaps up to a year, so it won't be an immediate start, um, but we'll be eager to get rolling when we can. So um, in the meantime, if you have any questions about the grant or the work, you know, please don't hesitate to contact Rebecca Morgan with the staff of the Boston MPO CTPS, who's our Director of Projects and Partnerships. So with that, I will move on to my more regular updates, if we can go to the side, thank you. Um, so first of all, I wanted to provide a few updates on the Long Range Transportation Plan, Destination 2050. Um, first, we emailed board members um, a new survey yesterday. It's a survey form that's capturing the types of questions that we asked at the workshop that we held on January 19th um, about the investment programs. And that's for any members who couldn't attend or if you'd like to provide more input after that workshop, um, anybody, any of the members can respond. And we ask that you respond by February 15th. And the contact for that is Michelle Scott at mscott at ctps.org. Um, and then, as I already mentioned in prior weeks, on January 25th, MEPC staff sent out the draft municipal and sub-municipal sub allocations of the population, household, and employment um, forecasts for 2050. And these support the LRTP development, which is why it's under this item. And MEPC is requesting feedback on these data by Friday, February 10th. Um, so for details on that, please look for the emails from MAPC staff. Uh, next slide, please. 
My last engagement update is around um, the fact that the survey that we've mentioned that's open to anybody to provide ideas for survey um, for studies um, for our FFY 2024 UPWP is still open and we are still looking for folks to continue to respond and provide some ideas for proposals for those studies. Um, this time a few samples I can give you of what's been recommended in the past are things like policy guidebooks. Um, a study on transportation access and service for older adults um, and studying the impact of new active transportation facilities. So just trying to provide a few samples to stimulate some, you know, interest in ideas. But again, anyone can submit an idea and you still have until February 15th to do so. Next slide, please. So I have a couple of updates around our project work. Um, one of them, the first, is to provide the, the board and the public an update on the locations that we as staff um, identified to study this federal fiscal year under what we're now calling the Multimodal Mobility Infrastructure Program. And these are studies that are programmed in the UPWP, and we do work to select um, appropriate um, locations for the work um, before we go, get it fully into the work scope. So first of all, there's a corridor study um, that we've identified Route 37, which is Franklin and Washington Street in Braintree. And the second is an intersection study, which is Washington Hanover intersection in Lynn. So if you have any um, concerns, questions, or just wanna connect on those um, locations, please let us know. And then we're also planning to work with the town of Concord on a smaller study under our community transportation technical assistance program. And what that's about is that the town at Concord is looking for um, recommendations, near-term recommendations around safety improvements at the route two crossings at Main Street and Old Road um, to nine acre corner. So um, like I said, a smaller study, but still if you're interested or have questions about it, please feel free to reach out to us. And Rebecca Morgan again is a great contact um, for that. So next, if we can go to the next slide, um, you know, this slide has the today's agenda items, and I wanted to provide some context to tie some of these presentations and discussions together, because um, there's a lot of relationship between these and other discussions we've been having. Um, so first, we will be talking today about the roadway safety performance targets. And similar to our last discussion about performance targets um, and what we heard the board discuss then, um, we anticipate you may feel some concern, um, as we do, about the trends we are seeing in our region around safety. Um, but I am grateful that I was able to also announce today the award of the Safe Streets and Roads for All grant, which is a significant investment um, and significant work that the MPO will be doing in turning these trends around. And I just want to um, just really state clearly that a safe transportation system continues to be a fundamental element of the MPO's vision, goals, and objectives that are in the long-range plan. And that segues into um, the first of the four presentations, which is that the revisions based on the input we've received to those um, vision goals and objectives will be discussed um, immediately after those um, safety performance targets. So after those two items, we'll be talking about the financial outlook for the TIP and the LRTP. Um, Ethan Lapointe, when he's talking about the LRT, or sorry, the TIP, of course, will be highlighting that we have more funding available in our current year than we have projects that are ready through the MPO's regional target funding allocation process. And that's part of another trend that board members have been discussing. Um, and one of the takeaways that Ethan will present is that you may wish to continue to discuss how to increase that pipeline of regional identified and scored projects, not only to fill the funding gaps, but also to um, kind of make sure that you feel like you have the best set of projects to um, choose between for those target funds. And so I wanted to tie this back to the presentation last uh, meeting where our federal partners raised this in the certification review report and they talked about the recommendations for considering innovative uses of target funds to increase the pipeline of projects. Um, and some of the elements of those recommendations were around advancing design or working with mass DOT to carry over unprogrammed balances. So I wanted to call your attention back to that report and those recommendations. Um, and then also some of you were involved in discussing this issue and some strategies in a TIP ad hoc and cost readiness committee that wrapped up back in 2021, I believe, if it's been that long ago. So with that, I can segue into the next item. We'll talk about the scoring itself for the um, TIP projects in the upcoming federal fiscal year 24 to 28 TIP. But then I'll wrap up the meeting myself by presenting a concept coming out of the Administration and Finance Committee, which could serve to build on um, some of these discussions I've been mentioning. So the idea for this committee came out of um, the ANF committee discussions about the operations plan 
And they wanted, they asked staff to develop a memo um, about what a new standing committee could look like to support the more detailed and deliberative conversations that could happen around the TIP process and potentially the pipeline challenges um, and other issues around the process. So I'll look forward to wrapping up the meeting with a presentation. And overall, I look forward to your questions, comments, and input on these agenda items. And thank you again for multiple weeks of MPO meetings um, in a row. And the last slide is the next meeting date. And that will be February 16th. So you will have um, a little bit of a break, a two week time frame. Um, please note we will be talking, we will need to endorse the federal fiscal year 23 to 27 TIP Amendment 3. We'll have probably a work scope and we'll continue to discuss TIP um, topics like readiness updates. So um, please um, do attend in two weeks' time. And with that, Mr. Chair, that's it. And I'm happy to take questions. Any questions from Dagan or Dagan? Seeing none, next item on the agenda is public comments. Are there any public comments at this time? Seeing none, if you want to comment during the meeting, raise your hand and we will try to call you. Committee chair's reports, are there any? Derek Cravat. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to say briefly that the next UPWP committee meeting is now scheduled for February 16th uh, after the NPO meeting at 1 p.m. Um, We'll be discussing the timeline for the federal fiscal year 2024 unified planning work program development um, and just setting the stage to kick that uh, planning cycle off. So um, more information to come, but just wanted to mention to put it on folks radar. Thank you. Thanks, Derek. Brian King. Thank you, um, uh, David. I just wanted to note that the administration and finance committee uh, has met recently. We met on the 19th to go over the uh, budget and spending of the organization through the end of 2022. And we met this morning to continue our work on developing the operations plan. And we look forward to continuing this work in two weeks. And of course, all are invited. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Next item on the agenda is the Regional Transportation Advisory Council report. Lynn? Thank you, Mr. Chair. We have not had an advisory council meeting since our last NPO meeting last week, but next week we, we're going to be meeting and we're going to have Betsy Harvey talk with us um, more about the MPO, MPO's equity work, um, including in, uh, her recent Title VI report and in some upcoming um, program goals. And, and also we're going to be doing a brainstorming session on uh, UPWP um, study proposals you know, with um, Trelake and Murthy. So we welcome you to, to that. And so thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Lynn. Next time on the agenda is the approval of the minutes of January 5th. Can I get a motion and a second from members to approve the minutes? Brian Kane. We can't hear you, Brian. Sorry, my hand was up from before, but I'm happy to make that motion, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Brian. Eric Barassa. Uh, I will second that motion. Motion has been made and seconded. Any comments, changes, questions, or suggestions on the minutes? Seeing none, please call the roll. David Muller? Yes. Laris Bedoy Liotto? Yes. Uh, John Romano? John Romano, yes. Allie Clayman? Allie Clayman, yes. Sarah Lee? Sarah Lee, yes. Eric Barassa? Eric Barassa, yes. Brian Kane? Brian Kane, yes. Leonard Diggins? Leonard Diggins, yes. Bill Conroy? Bill Conroy, yes. Jim Fitzgerald? I will come back. Um, Eric Molinari? Eric Molinari, yes. David Kozis? David Kozis, yes. Rob King? Rob King, yes. Tom Bent? Tom, I think you can unmute yourself. Uh, I think he's still having audio issues on his side, but um, he's thumbing up, uh, so I will take that as a yes. Uh, Austin Saganowitz? Austin Segato abstain. Dennis G. And Betty? Dennis G. And Betty, yes. Darlene Wynn? Darlene Wynn, yes. Jennifer Constable? Jennifer Constable, yes. And Tom O'Rourke? Tom O'Rourke, yes. Uh, motion carries, Mr. Chair. 
Thank you, Donna. Next item on the agenda is the roadway safety performance targets. Sam Taylor. Yes, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Sam Taylor. Um, I have actually uh, present to you all. I'm the new uh, performance-based uh, planning and programming manager here at CTPS. Um, and today I'll be presenting to you uh, the 2023 uh, roadway safety performance targets. Uh, next slide, please. So a quick overview of what um, we will cover today. Uh, first, we will do a, a, a quick overview of uh, performance-based planning and programming um, updates and upcoming activities. Uh, then we will get into the roadway safety trends uh, targets. Then we will get into an overview of uh, the per performance measures from the last, um, uh, last several years. Uh, then we will cover a few uh, safety challenges and opportunities. Uh, and then at the end, uh, we will uh, board uh, uh, to vote and there will be time for questions as well. Next slide, please. So again, the requested uh, MPO action here today is a vote to support uh, the Massachusetts Department of Transportation's calendar 2023 roadway safety targets. Um, and these targets will be reported um, uh, by the MPO uh, in future uh, planning documents. Next slide, please. So a quick overview of where we are. Um, uh, cycle for our federal performance uh, measures and targets. Uh, today we're covering roadway safety. Uh, and in the next few weeks, uh, we will also cover transit safety and transit asset uh, conditions, uh, which you see on the right side of the screen. Uh, and just a reminder that these are uh, targets. So uh, those other two will be coming in the next few weeks, but today we're covering roadway safety. Next slide, please. So today uh, the board will be asked to, to vote on these five uh, targets for, for five uh, federally mandated performance measures. Um, the five are on your screen, uh, number of fatalities, the rate of fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles traveled, the number of serious injuries, the rate of serious injuries per 100 million vehicle miles traveled, uh, and the number of motorized fatalities and non-motorized serious injuries. Uh, so those would be individuals such as pedestrians, cyclists, uh, those on scooters, uh, and other uh, means of transportation. Uh, and of course, the goal is to minimize values uh, for all of these. And these, these measures apply to all public roads, uh, regardless of uh, jurisdiction or ownership. And all of the targets that you will see today will be based on rolling five-year averages. Next slide. So this year, uh, as, as Tegan uh, covered in her executive director's report, uh, there are certainly some safety challenges, uh, draft data for all of 2022. Uh, a likely continued spike uh, in fatalities and serious injuries, uh, which has been occurring over the last couple of years since, since 2020 and the, and the, the, the start of the pandemic. Um, uh, Boston and Massachusetts um, trends likely follow or largely follow nationwide trends. Uh, nationwide, we're seeing rates of people uh, speeding more, using seatbelts less uh, and being more distracted uh, while driving than they were uh, before the pandemic. Uh, in in uh, Massachusetts, uh, we're seeing motorcycle involved fatalities increased, um, non-motorized fatalities also likely increased in 2022 uh, based on, on, on very early data. And also the share of uh, the, the share of fatal crashes on interstate roadways appear, appear increased during the pandemic. Uh, in the Boston region, um, uh, data from the Boston region shows that uh, we are also largely following some of the same patterns uh, that the state and, and the nation are seeing. Next slide. So these are the five uh, proposed targets for you for, for calendar year 2023. Uh, you will see on the screen uh, the 2023 target uh, for fatalities is 355. Uh, the rate, the, the 
The rate per 100 million vehicle miles traveled uh, is 0.59. The number of serious injuries is 2,569. The target for uh, the serious injury rate per uh, 100 million vehicle miles traveled is 4.25. Uh, and the number of non-motorized fatalities serious injuries is 437. Again, these are, are 20, the, the state's 2023 uh, targets based uh, on, a, on a five year rolling average. So this would be uh, targets for uh, 2019 through 2023. Uh, and in the uh, last column on the right, you see the Massachusetts uh, long-term target, which uh, all show zeros, um, just to uh, reiterate that uh, these, these zeros that you see here are not blanks. Um, these are truly the, uh, the state's long-term uh, targets going well beyond 2023. Next slide. So some key takeaways uh, from, from the targets that have been set. Uh, MassDOT and the Executive Office of uh, Public Safety and Security have proposed uh, these targets uh, Largely in response to recent trends, uh, targets for fatalities and serious injuries are less aggressive uh, than the 2022 targets were. Uh, targets for non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries will be more aggressive than the 2022 targets. Uh, and these targets uh, assume increases uh, from 2022 in fatalities and serious injuries um, for, for motorized uh, passengers. Um, and just, just to uh, uh, clear up any confusion when I say uh, more, uh, a more aggressive target would mean uh, aiming for uh, fewer incidents, uh, fewer crashes, and, and less aggressive uh, would mean the opposite. Uh, next slide, please. So just to show you um, some of the targets, uh, these are past, current, and proposed uh, targets for this year. Uh, you will notice uh, that the, the number of fatalities uh, the target for the number of fatalities for 2023, which is that first metric there, is, is uh, higher than that of uh, the CY 2022. Uh, this year, uh, the state has set it for 355. Last year, it was set for 340. Uh, actually, the first four uh, of these targets uh, are higher than that of 2022, uh, except for the final one, uh, which is the number of non-motorized fatalities and non-motorized serious injuries. Um, which uh, the target has been set for, for a decrease uh, from 400, 471 uh, to 437 for this year. Next slide, please. And just a quick review on the, on the target setting process. Um, the, uh, the US DOT establishes uh, these measures and then the state sets a, sets a target for these measures. Uh, and then within 180 EMPOs uh, uh, choose to either support the statewide targets or set separate targets uh, for our uh, MPO area. Next slide, please. So the next handful of charts will show uh, charts like this, uh, showing recent, um, uh, recent trends along with the targets uh, for context. So this, this chart shows the number of fatalities over the past 10 years or so. Uh, as you can see, uh, there were slight decreases leading up until about uh, 2021. See that 2017 to 2021 um, bar there shows a, shows a slight increase from the one before. Um, and then uh, given, given early draft data for 2022, uh, we see that the, the rolling five-year average uh, will, will likely increase by about fatalities from 360 to three, uh, 377. Uh, and then that last bar there on the right in the lightest shade of green uh, is, is the target that, that the state has set uh, for 2023, which um, uh, despite being uh, a, a higher target than 2022 is still uh, uh, quite lower than the um, uh, five-year average, uh, the latest five-year average from, from 2018 to 2022. Next slide. This slide shows the fatality rate per 100 million vehicle miles traveled. Um, so the, uh, the dark circles show uh, data from the past uh, several years. Those have been, that, that data has been closed. Uh, the open circles 
are also data from the past uh, uh, several years. However, those are that is draft data since since 20, 2020 and 2021. Um, data for fatalities is still technically open, uh, uh, hence the open circles there. Um, so what you see is uh, on the road, uh, the last two targets that have been set. So this year's target of 0.59 uh, in the 2019 to 2023 um, bar and uh, last year's target of 0.56 uh, fatalities per 100 million vehicle miles traveled in the 2018 to 2022 bar. Uh, would also like to note that uh, the uh, uh, fatality rate for the Boston region um, uh, is, is significantly lower than that of uh, the state. Um, and we can, uh, expect to see that uh, over the next couple of years as well. Slide. And also just to add some context uh, to, to, to the last two charts, uh, this is a chart showing an annual vehicle miles traveled. Um, uh, you can that travel uh, peaked around 2019. Uh, with, with that rate being 649. Uh, and then in 2020, with the onset of, of, of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, vehicle miles traveled uh, dropped significantly to 500, 540, followed by an increase in 2021, uh, perhaps as, as people uh, uh, resumed their, their uh, normal routines uh, to 603. We do not have a figure yet for uh, 2022. However, um, uh, that is forecasted to to increase one, but essentially what this what this graph is here to show is that um, uh, fatalities uh, in the last couple of years have have increased slightly, even as driving has been down over levels seen uh, uh, prior to the pandemic. Next slide. So somewhat corresponding uh, to the to the prior slides on on. Uh, vehicle fatalities. These are the number of serious injuries. Um, the again, the the dark shades of green are uh, are are uh, actual averages. The lighter shade of green uh, is draft data that um, has yet to be technically closed, uh, but but uh, we we feel pretty solid about. Um, so uh, serious injuries have been uh, uh, decreasing uh, for the most part over the past ten years. You see an empty bar there for 2018 to 2022. That is because we do not yet have uh, data from 2022 on serious injuries. Um, so uh, we are not able to calculate a, a rolling five-year average for that period yet. However, um, you will see the, uh, the, the target in the last bar under uh, or above rather 2019 to 2023, that target of 2,569 um, is a bit lower uh, than the last uh, rolling five-year average uh, that is shown on this graph. Uh, next slide, please. And here we have the serious injury rate per 100 million vehicle miles traveled. Um, we have the, uh, the past two targets that have been set by the state this year is uh, uh, 4.25 serious injuries per uh, 100 million vehicle miles. Last year's target was uh, 4.11. However, the last um, five-year period that we have uh, uh, draft data for is, is um, 2017 to 2021 when, when the serious injury rate uh, was uh, 4.3 uh, per vehicle, 100, me 100 million vehicle miles traveled. Um, so that target, uh, again, similar uh, with fatalities, that, that, that target for serious injury rate is still lower uh, than the last five-year um, range that we have uh, finalized data for. Next slide, please. And on this slide, this is our, our, our fifth and final uh, performance measure. This, this shows recent trends for uh, the number of non-motorized fatalities and non-motorized serious injuries, um, which uh, uh, on this, just to note, are combined. They are not broken out um, by fatalities and serious injuries separately, uh, as, as on previous slides. Um, uh, the good news is that these uh, over time, these these uh, uh, the the trends here. Um, it, there was a peak of about 500, 550 of these incidents between twenty twelve and twenty sixteen. Um, in that rolling average, uh, uh, the latest period that we have data for is twenty seventeen to twenty twenty one, where the figure is four hundred and sixty seven. Uh, 
Uh, that last green bar on the right uh, shows that the target has been set by the state uh, for the next uh, five year rolling average to be 437, which is uh, a bit lower than, than 467 um, from, from the last five year average that we have. And again, that, that empty bar that you see from 2018 to 2022 is just there to um, uh, show that uh, we do not have um, uh, data for uh, fatalities and serious injuries uh, that has been closed uh, for the year of 2022. So able to calculate a rolling five-year average uh, for that period. Next slide, please. So given what we've seen uh, in the past uh, handful of slides, there are a number of opportunities, the state and, and the Boston region, uh, the first of which being the implementation of uh, the state's next uh, strategic highway safety plan. Um, there is also uh, happening right now the development of Destination 2050, uh, which is the long term uh, uh, long range transportation plan uh, uh, and, and the uh, uh, needs assessment. Um, there is also the, uh, the rollout of new safety related provisions and opportunities through um, the federal bipartisan infrastructure law uh, that, that was passed last year. Um, and along with it, new uh, national roadway safety strategies uh, and programs. Next slide, please. So as Tegan mentioned uh, in her executive director's report, um, we uh, just, uh, the Boston Region MPO, uh, received grant funding from uh, the, the United States Department, Department of Transportation uh, for about 2.2 million uh, to create a regional safety action plan. Uh, this plan would uh, adopt sa a safe systems, uh, which you see um, in, that, in that nice uh, chart on the left, which uh, many of you have probably seen uh, in the past. Um, this, uh, such a plan would also work towards uh, regional uh, vision zero goals uh, and offers uh, an opportunity for longer term in, in these areas. Next slide, please. So as mentioned uh, in the last slide, the 2023 Strategic Highway Safety Plan uh, is, is being implemented. Um, this plan really focused on reducing fatalities and serious injuries. Uh, the plan has strategies for addressing top risk uh, locations and populations for fatal crashes. Uh, and for those uh, familiar with the plan, that is uh, you, that can be found in the Initiative 2 section. Um, MPOs can use their target funds to address high risk locations to improve safety, um, uh, similar to, to how the state can. Um, uh, and also in this plan, there's an emphasis on reducing crashes uh, despite riskier behaviors such as um, speeding and, and, and less uh, since the start of the pandemic. Next slide, please. Uh, also in the strategic highway safety plan um, is, is an emphasis on uh, implementing for speeds, um, uh, whether it be adjusting operating speeds through uh, roadway designs, um, setting procedures for, for target setting um, uh, in all types of uh, projects, uh, amending state regulations related to speed, um, and also wanted to point out that the, uh, the, the 2023 um, strategic highway safety plan can be found in the link on the slide, and I believe Aaron might be able to um, share that with, uh, with the group. Uh, next slide, please. So to conclude, uh, uh, just a reminder that today's uh, requested action of, of, of the MPO board is to vote to support uh, MassDOT CY uh, 2023 roadway safety targets. Uh, uh, those are based on the, the, the five uh, targets and performance measures that were uh, laid out earlier in this presentation. Uh, and if we could just move on to the next and final slide. Um, these are the, again, these are the five that have been set. Uh, in, uh, in the areas of fatalities, serious injuries, and non-motorized fatalities and serious injuries uh, for uh, 2023 uh, as set by, by MassDOT. Um, that concludes this presentation, and um, I guess we will open it for 
um, for questions. Thank you, Sam. Questions from the members? Brian Kane. Thank you, David. Sam, thank you. Um, back this up for me a little bit and, and just try to explain this to me as simply as possible because I'm I'm not a I'm not a numbers guy. What is the target number of fatalities or or targets the wrong word? What 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 is a target that we are, that you are suggesting we vote to be acceptable? What is the number of serious injuries and what is the number of fatalities? So uh, Michelle and uh, De uh, Derek Kravat, also pl please feel free to chime in these targets um, that I believe are still shown on the screen. Um, the, the, the number of fatalities uh, of 355 for 2023, um, this is the target that has been set. This is a roll based on a rolling five-year average. Um, so this would be based on uh, the number of fatalities that would occur uh, in 2023 um, uh, based on a five-year average from uh, 2019 to 2023. So um, uh, at the, to, to meet that target, uh, the, the, the number of fatalities between 2019 and 2023 would uh, need to uh, average out to 355 or less. Um, I hope that answers your question about about that okay so that works out to about one fatality a day and about seven serious injuries a day uh and i and i get that that's what's been set by by the commonwealth and 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 we're kind of stuck with that so what is the target that you're asking this mpo to adopt Yes, this is the target that that is being put forward today. Okay, so I'm confused then. So is this what MassDOT has already adopted or is this what you're asking this MPO to adopt? So Sam, you, you want me to help? Uh, yes, please. Okay, so Brian, like the other performance measures we've brought to the MPO, what the federal government requires us to do is to set a, state, a statewide target and then within eight, within uh, whatever, whatever the number is, so a certain number of months, the MPO either has to endorse our targets, in which case you don't have your own target and you're just committing to helping us achieve our target, or the MPO can set its own targets. So the MPO could, if it's so desired, set its own targets and you know, state in the TIP and the, and the LRTP how they are going to, to achieve their targets, or they can adopt our targets and just commit to helping us achieve our targets. But these are our targets. The recommendation from the from the staff is that, that the MPO adopt, endorse MassDOT's targets, but the MPO is free to adopt its own targets if it sees fit. All right, thank you for explaining that to me. So I guess I'm gonna sort of restate what I said a couple of weeks ago, which is I, I think that this MPO's overarching goal and objective should be a reduction in VMT, especially single occupancy vehicle trips through investing in and improving public transportation and non-motorized forms of transportation. That will not only help our environment, it'll help our economy and it will help us improve or this is not a target, this is weird. You don't wanna exceed these targets. You want to <laughs> underachieve on these targets, help us underachieve on these targets. And so I guess I would suggest that we should consider as an MPO, asking staff to go back and come up with targets that are better than one death a day and seven serious injuries a day for the Boston region. Uh, we've all seen in our communities that traffic is up, VMT is up, despite what the statistics say. Congestion is certainly back. We are, what, the fourth most congested region in the world, uh, according to some measures. And I, and I think we can do better than that. So, um, and I, I don't know how to do this. I don't know what the technical capability to do this is. This is one of those things where, where the, the board isn't really asked to weigh in on the process, um, but I think we, we can do better. And, and so I'm just going to ask my colleagues to consider that we do better. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Lynn Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And to you, Mr. Kane, 
the advisory council is here to help out with that. I mean, so, so, and, and, and really I'm serious about that because you know, one of the things I would like to do is to understand um, better how the state um, sets its targets. I mean, and as um, um, Mr. Taylor mentioned to I me, mean, there is the state highway safety plan, which truly does have a vision zero um, as its goal being for I mean, all injuries, I mean, um, fatalities. I mean, and as he pointed out, they have um, put out their, uh, their, their plan, I mean, in the next phase is to develop the action plan and they're getting to work on that apparently within the next few weeks or so and everyone's invited to participate in that. But I would like to find out who at the state is helping to develop these targets be so that maybe we can have a conversation with them at an advisory council meeting. And I also want to point out, Brian, be that the 355 target, as David mentioned, is statewide. If you looked at the charts me that Sam presented, the Boston region numbers are significantly lower. Mean, and so we do have like fewer than one um, death per, per day. Mean, and so, and that's part of the reason I kind of want to understand me. I think you're right, Brian. Mean, um, so it would be good if the Boston region set its own targets. I understand why we're not based on the conversation we had last month, but maybe maybe we can understand better me what can be done me to set our own targets and also understand me what are the components that are leading to these fatalities like who is it that's getting killed in, uh, um, in these accidents? I mean, is there some kind of distribution across ages or whatnot? So I think it'll take more time than we have in a meeting here, but as I said, that's what the advisors council's for. So we'll try and figure out who to talk to and invite everyone to one of our meetings. Thank you. David Cozes. Um, thank you. So I think that we're, we're constantly making changes to try to make our roadways safer, right? We're, adding safety zones and you know setting a lower statutory speed limit and looking for times that we could re reduce our regulatory speed limits and adding bike lanes and adding safer pedestrian crossings and you know what else more lighting more enforcement just redesigning intersections and i think we're still seeing so many crashes right probably across the region and it, it seems like not all, but so much of it is this, this distracted driving, like Sam said, or just impatience, right? Not wanting to wait for a safe time to proceed or something. So, you know, to me, it seems very reasonable to have this sort of maybe less aggressive target, but still moving in the right direction because we can't control everything, right? And especially driver behavior unless we could figure out a way to better control um, just behavior on the road. But to me, this seems like a reasonable approach and I would support it. Thank you, David. Eric Barassa. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, uh, two questions I have. One is, um, just to confirm, this is just a we're, we're setting the this 2023 calendar year target. We will set, you know, additional calendar year, or additional year targets at, at, at later dates. That's my first question. Um, and then secondly, um, what is the sort of consequence for um, setting a target and then having, say, the number of fatalities exceed that? What is the you know, what happens if that if that occurs? Oh, Derek Cravat, you have your hand up. You want to try to answer one or both of those questions? Yes, yeah, absolutely. So to the first question about um, future targets, this is a, a annual requirement. So the federal regulation requires that both state DOTs and MPOs adopt safety targets annually, and the deadline for MPOs to adopt them is end of February each year. So we would be coming back next year to adopt calendar year 2024 safety targets. And then to the second question about consequences, um, there's two uh, sort of penalties written into the regulations. One is that the state is required to spend its full apportionment of all highway safety improvement program funds, which is a core federal formula funding source that's supposed to be dedicated to safety projects. Um, I, it, I think nationally, some states might not be as committed to funding safety projects. I think in Massachusetts, that's an effort. And um, every year, you know, that that is something that I know our highway division is committed to spending all the safety dollars anyway. So in that sense, it's, you know, it's 
that's in the regulations that we would just have to actually obligate the full apportionment of all the HSEP funding and also submit uh, like a, a sort of, I guess, report describing steps that will be taken. And I know our traffic safety section is already mindful of that and, and thinking about trends and, and being proactive about formulating that, that kind of response uh, in the event that the targets aren't met. Um, so that's in response to uh, yeah, Eric's questions. Yeah. I was also going to address one of Len's questions. If oh, that's ahead. okay. Um, so Len had asked, "Who sets the targets?" That's the that is the traffic safety section, and it's in coordination with the Executive Office of Public Safety and Security EOPS, and they report those in April each year um, for the next calendar year to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration or NHTSA. So I'd be happy to connect you, Len, with the folks uh, in in our traffic safety section that, that might be able to present um, at our tech. And then okay. just, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, Derek, I thought you were done. No, I was I was just going to add one more thing in response to some of Brian's and others' comments that I think the the process of the MPO endorsing the targets, I think, is more of a reflection that the MPO and us at MassDOT are working collaboratively to decrease these trends. I'd say it's less about a number. Um, you know, we're not saying it's an acceptable level. It's just saying that based on the guidance we have, that's part of this requirement to set you know, a number that, that that's just, we're just, you know, doing that for this requirement and, and for reporting purposes. But I think the, the, the procedure to adopt a target is more about just a commitment to the MPO working collaboratively with us at the state level um, to make progress on, on decreasing all of these trends. So I'll just add that as just, you know, an alternative way to frame that, uh, what the MPO is committing to. Thank you, Derek. Jim Fitzgerald, and I'll get back to you, Brian. Jim Fitzgerald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so Eric kind of asked my question. Um, he's usually quicker than me, um, but can you confirm, Derek, did you just say um, over the past few years, we have been spending all the HSIP? Is that, is that what you just said? That's my understanding. I can confirm that, um, but I know but, our highway division is, yeah, is, is, consistently spending there yeah they are a lot of aids of funding right. and so just to clarify what i think was said so um the implications of not meeting the target are just there's not like uh the fed saying we need to spend more on in the HSIP category it's just that you need to spend all of it it's already is that what you think that's correct yes yeah, so yeah we would just each year we get a new number uh, that's a portion in each step, and we would just have to show that we were spending all of it. And there's an option to like transfer certain funds from one source to another. Like right. that would not that would not be allowed. Uh, we would have to gotcha. actually hit the. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Brian Kane. Thank you, David. Uh, just want to push back very gently on 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 uh, David Coz's. Um, I, I don't think we can. We should say. There's nothing we can do because drivers are behaving badly. That that lets drivers off the hook. I think, and I, and I know you're not you're not saying this. Uh, we can use design and and how we design and regulate and enforce our roadway rules and laws and regulations to make drivers be responsible. And and there's many ways that we try to do that. So, yes, distracted driving is 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 a scourge across uh, the nation, if not the world. Uh, but drivers should not be off the hook for 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 their actions. And I know you're not saying that. My, my question is, uh, following up on what Len said, um, Len, uh, and you're much better at, at the numbers game here than I am. Uh, you suggested that in, in the presentation, there is a lower number for the Boston region. If, if that's the case, then why wouldn't this MPO set that as the Boston region target is, is I guess, my question for you, David or Derek or Sam or, or whomever uh, can answer these questions. Thank you, sir. So Sam, you want to go back to pick pick one of the, the slides that shows the statewide target versus the MPO target. Yes, perhaps we go back to slide 11, Aaron. The number of fatalities. Yes, this one. Right. So Ryan, as Sam noted, the blue bar is Boston. 
and the green bars are the state. So th this appeal could certainly, and instead of adopting our 355 target, adopt 108 or adopt 105 or adopt 103. I'm just, I, I, I'm not clear what happens. I'm clear from Derek's presentation, Derek's answer, what happens if the state fails to meet its target? I'm not at all clear what happens if a region or an MPO fails to meet its target, its own person, own individual target, because we've never had an MPO adopt an individual target yet. So I, I'm not, I just, I'm not clear, but, but to, to your point, if you want to adopt a different target, theoretically, you could do what we do, which is adopt a target based on trends and you do have Sam do some kind of analysis of the trends and give you, give us a target, or you could go more aggressive than trends and say, hey, our target is half of what we have today. You know, I mean, all sorts of options are available to the NPO. It's, it's just, this is the data that you would base your, theoretically base your targets on. Eric? You're muted, Eric. Thank you. Um, what I want to say is um, I, I really appreciate this conversation and I, I appreciate Brian, I think, challenging this, um, you know, the sort of this, this looking at sort of the trends and the data and saying, why are you know, why aren't we planning for zero, which is the long term goal. And, and um, I definitely appreciate the conversation. I think the purpose of this, you know, from the federal standpoint, which, um, which I feel like, you um, uh, you know, some of the folks from Federal Highway have, have said before is really to challenge us all to look at this data and to prioritize safety. And I feel like that's what we are doing as a state and a region. And the fact that we just have some, you know, additional resources to, to, to put together a regional safety plan, you know, makes me feel good that we are um, going to be prioritizing this um, over the coming years and in, in the long range plan. To some degree, I feel like these numbers are somewhat arbitrary, whether we whether we pick, you know, this sort of trends number, or we or we decide to go with something lower, um, I, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't feel like it makes that much of a of a difference. I think at the end of the day, it's about using this information to say, hey, we really want to prioritize safety. We want to be looking at what's happening. We want to see what the trends are, and we want to be pushing it. Um, you know, we want to be pushing it down. And um, you know that's I think feel like the point of the the conversation today. Michelle Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to to add first. You had um, posed the point about um, one of the you know what the MPO might have to do to set um, separate targets for this federal process, and and you know as you. You correctly acknowledge this is not something that's happened um, in Massachusetts and hasn't happened in, in most places in the country based on dialogues that we have uh, through AMPO. But I think, you know, one of the things we would certainly have to do is, you know, account for our separate approach and still continue to coordinate uh, with the Massachusetts Department of Transportation um, about, you know, the approach that we're using and, you know, work with with you all on recommendations around that. Uh, the other item I wanted to mention relates to the safe streets and roads for all uh, grant and action plan that uh, both Taken and Sam uh, referenced in their remarks. Um, one of the activities in the scope, um, as you'll be kind of learning about more or the MPO as a board, uh, board as a whole will be learning about, about more as we embark as a process on this process is um, there is a, a activity specifically related to goal setting um, and kind of interim goal setting that relates to achieving the outcomes of that action plan to achieve zero fatalities and serious injuries. So there will be kind of a robust process being undertaken, you know, through that plan um, to explore um, how to set more specific goals um, for uh, moving towards uh, zero fatalities and serious injuries through that plan. So that could be a good place to kind of, you know, put that put that energy in focus. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Kim Miller. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, first of all, thank you, Sam. Very, very thorough uh, presentation. Uh, one thing that I think, uh, you know, all of these charts show the five-year rolling average, and I think uh, it may also be helpful if you could overlay actually the individual year 
uh, numbers or maybe show a separate graph that shows them because these really do mask the what the recent very recent trends if you actually show the the numbers for the estimates for 2020 and 2021 it's, it shows uh fatalities increasing dramatically uh over over 400 or 420 for uh 20 uh estimates for 2021 and 2022 so uh, i think that might be helpful just for context to show what's uh happening uh in each individual year uh, the second thing, just in terms of the penalty, uh, I'm not clear what a penalty would be for an, uh, you know, for an individual MPO, but it, uh, in terms of the uh, HSIP funding, uh, the state does not send, spend uh, up to its apportionment each year. It does very, uh, very close, though. Uh, and remember, there's always that difference between uh, the obligational authority that's available uh, and uh, what's apportioned. And so uh, uh, there is that gap. So just keep that in mind that, that if, if by some chance uh, uh, a state did not meet its targets, we would require them to spend up to its apportionment. That would mean that there would be some other funding categories that you would not be able to spend up to your apportionment because of the difference uh, between OA obligation authority and apportionment. Uh, uh, finally, just in terms of the Safe Streets role, I would also add, uh, in addition to the Boston MPO getting an award, uh, the cities of Weymouth and Somerville got awards for doing a planning as well as the town of Denham. So we will be in contact with both the MPO and those communities. Uh, and finally, just as I say every year when we have this discussion, uh, Massachusetts is one of 16 states that, do, that does not have, have a primary seatbelt law. I would encourage all of you to work with your state legislators to see, uh, and, the, and the administration, which I think is supportive, to uh, see if that can be changed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ken. And I would note, since Ken noted the others, that Boston actually received an implementation grant, grant under Safe Streets and Roads for All. I believe they're getting yeah. $9 million to do some intersection improvements. Yes, that's correct. Thank you. Yep. Others, any other questions or comments at this time? Seeing none, I need a motion to either adopt these targets or endorse these targets as presented today, or a motion to ask staff to come back on the 16th with a new presentation on what targets the MPO could adopt if it so chose for its own individual targets. Brian Kane. Uh, thanks. I, just just a question before any of that happens. Um, Len, did, did you request more information for for our tech is did, did i understand you correctly yeah um mr chair yes you're going on. yeah uh, uh, uh yeah yeah i did and i got i got an answer for me from from derek it's more so to follow up and have um people talk with the advisor council so we can understand more about what goes into the numbers and maybe understanding you know um, deviations from past thank you so is there a motion Then Diggins. I'll be happy to make that motion if we can get that last screen. I mean, I think I'll try it on my own. Make a motion to adopt and uh, targets me for uh, Massachusetts and for the calendar year of 23. Thank Is that you. close enough, Mr. Chair? Yep. Okay, great, Derek Barassa. I'll second that. Thank you. Motion having been made and seconded. Please call the roll. David Muller. Yes. Laris. Badoy Liotto? Yes. John Romano? John Romano, yes. Ali Clayman? Ali Clayman, yes. Sarah Lee? Sarah Lee, yes. Eric Barassa? Eric Barassa, yes. Brian Kane? Brian Kane, no. Leonard Diggins? Leonard Diggins, yes. Bill Conroy? Bill Conroy, yes. Jim Fitzgerald? Jim Fitzgerald, yes. Yeah. Eric Molinari? Do you like what Eric Molinari, is? yes. David Kozis? David Kozis, yes. Uh, Mr. Chair, Claire Ricker has arrived, uh, and I'd like to add her to the list. Uh, Claire yeah. Ricker? Claire? 
Okay. We'll, I'm sorry. Uh, Claire Ricker, yes. Couldn't find the mute. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Rob King? Rob King, yes. Tom Bent? Tom Bent, yes. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Good to Austin hear your voice, Austin Segedo, yes. Yeah, I've been having uh, technical difficulties this morning, David. <laughs> I'm oh, sorry, Jonathan, go on. No, no worries, Mr. Chair. Uh, Dennis Giambetti. Dennis Giambetti, yes. Uh, Darlene Nguyen. Darlene Nguyen, yes. Jennifer Constable. Jennifer Constable, yes. And Tom O'Rourke. Tom O'Rourke, yes. Motion carries, Mr. Chair. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sam. Next item on the agenda is revisions to the draft destination 2050 planning framework. Michelle Scott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Michelle Scott, manager of the Long Range Transportation Plan. And uh, as this morning, I'll be going over some updates we've made to the draft destination 2050 planning framework since uh, our initial presentation on December 15th. Next slide, please. Um, so we've done a couple of things with this draft framework since we last spoke with you all. Um, you know, these a couple of these are highlighted on these key takeaway slides, including, you know, clarifying some language and concepts that we've reflected in the set of vision goals and objectives, you know, expand on some ideas that we proposed in some of our initial suggestions for this framework. And we've also responded to feedback from MPO members, uh, members of the advisory council, and um, information that we're collecting through the LRTP vision and priority survey. And so today we're asking for your consensus as a board, um, you know, on this planning framework so that we can continue to advance work on Destination 2050. And this includes things like, you know, making sure our investment programs are in line with these new goals, um, developing scoring criteria for projects for consideration in the LRTP and things of that nature uh, to support, you know, that uh, obtaining the concurrence, we have some discussion questions. You know, do you have questions about some of the updates that we've made since, since December? And you know, do you support this revised framework? Next slide, please. So I'll give a quick recap of the planning framework that we're talking about today and how we put it together talk about some of the input and feedback collection activities that we've been engaged in since December, go over the framework revisions by goal area, discuss some um, next steps that we would have um, for this planning framework once we have your support, and then open up things up for discussion. Uh, there is a piece of material to support uh, you know, your review of this material today. It's on the MPO meeting calendar. Um, so the, the packet is made up of a cover memo, which will cover a lot of the points I'm going to make in this presentation about the changes we've made and how we've collected feedback. There's also the revised, um, so as of today, February 2nd version of the framework, the December 15th version of the framework for comparison, and also a copy of the vision goals and objectives that are part of our current active plan, which is Destination 2040 that you all adopted in 2019. So hopefully those can be tools that you can uh, use for your consideration as we proceed. Next slide, please. So again, just to put this in the context of overall Destination 2050 activities, uh, the six of which are highlighted in this diagram here, we're focused on the framework. And again, you know, advancing on this framework will help us carry out activities in terms of strategies and allocation that are out ahead of us. Next slide, please. So you may remember the slide from back in December. It highlights some of the major inputs to the MPO's planning framework, which is made up of a vision, series of goals, and objectives within those goals. And then what the, that framework um, does for us in terms of MPO process. So there are four components that go into this framework. Um, of course, feedback um, from you all as MPO members is a key component. Also hearing um, feedback from our transportation agency partners, such as MassDOT or the MBTA, as well as members of the public, um, certainly shapes this framework. Uh, we also review partner plans and policies, such as the Strategic Highway Safety Plan we referenced earlier, 
or um, the Commonwealth Global Warming Solutions Act when we're thinking about how to set this framework up. And of course, bringing forward um, staff's ideas, working with transportation planning concepts and issues in the region as we're developing this framework. Once we have this in place, it does a couple things for us. It guides how we craft our MPO investment programs, uh, which was the, the subject of the discussion we had at the workshop back on January 19th. Um, it also shapes the approaches that the MPO uses to select projects, um, particularly through our TIP project selection criteria, as well as guides the ways that the MPO develops its annual unified planning work program. And finally, it's a key tool that uh, staff and board members and others can use to communicate the values of the MPO to partners and stakeholders. Next slide, please. Um, so this structure highlights kind of the, the sequence of elements of the planning framework. Um, we have an overall vision that expresses our hopes for the transportation system in the region as a whole, um, to build on specific access aspects, excuse me, of that vision, we have a series of goals. Each goal includes a series of objectives that define specific actions to take or places where the MPO will put its focus to help accomplish that goal. And all of these you know, goals and objectives can be tied into our performance-based planning and programming process. Next slide, please. So as I referenced at the outset, we shared an initial draft of a planning framework with you all on December 15th. This followed on um, work that we had done uh, with you all and other partners in the summer and fall to collect some additional feedback um, to take a look back at Destination 2040, what goals and objectives we had there, and figure out how to recraft things for this upcoming long-range transportation plan. So the diagram on the left side of the slide highlights um, the general structure of how we put this together. Um, one you know, thing we've done with the framework this time is really have equity be not only a standalone goal, but have elements reflected in each of the other goals included in the framework. Um, you know, One of the things we've done is put more emphasis on destination access, resiliency, and health as we were crafting our goals and objectives. Um, for our safety goal, you know, really giving that more of a vision or vision zero orientation that, than we've had in the past. And also, um, you know, one thing we can talk about as well is you know, developing some proposed objectives related to mode shift and VMT reduction. Um, when thinking about how to set objectives for the MPO for the next plan. Next slide, please. So since December, um, we've engaged in some activities to collect feedback from you all and from other partners. Um, following the meeting on December 15th, we had a workshop uh, to go over you know, people's feedback about this framework and other things that could be updated or changed. Um, we also issued a survey. And again, I really appreciate the <laughs> the work that folks have put in you all to complete some of those surveys they're a great way for us to be getting input really need to advance the long-range transportation plan we kind of repeated this process um, in terms of the workshop with the regional transportation advisory council um, and one of the things we tried to do is really expand to the extent we could invites um, to folks that may not regularly come to advisory council meetings, but you know represent stakeholder agencies in the region and may be interested in helping us develop our next set of goals and objectives for the LRTP. Uh, another key source of input, which I referenced back in December, was our LRTP vision and priority survey. Um, we closed the survey recently on January 20th. It was open for about nine weeks overall. Um, we ultimately received approximately 982 responses, you know, that answered some or all of the questions. Um, this survey, as I'll talk about in a minute, was a helpful component for the work that we were doing for the planning framework, but we'll also be referencing those responses as we move ahead into working more on the investment programs and allocation of funding to those programs. Next slide, please. So again, you know, back in December and in earlier phases of the framework development process, I referenced some guiding principles um, related to how this framework um, should function. You know, there are some key points highlighted on this slide, including, you know, does this uh, framework clearly communicate the MPO's values? Does it support your decision making as board members? How does it balance you know, aspirational components and reality? 
how effectively can we measure it, and things of that nature. And so we incorporated questions around some of these themes um, when holding workshops, conducting surveys, and generally talking with folks about how to approach updates. Next slide, please. So just to touch again on some of the survey material, um, we've got some updated charts compared to what we showed you back in December. Um, the vision and priority survey included questions asking folks to highlight keywords that describe their ideal transportation system, and you can see those reflected in the word cloud here. Um, you know, themes like reliability, transit service frequency, um, safety, affordability, and these were themes that we wanted to make sure were really present and clear when developing uh, this framework. Next slide, please. Again, this is our um, uh, priority information from our priority ranking question, and you can kind of see in the chart here, um, you know, the Priority areas are highlighted in the row across the top, and the rank that people assign them are highlighted in the, the far left column. The shading indicates where most people applied um, the ranking for that uh, particular item. You can see some things like transit access and reliability and walking and bike lead. biking safety um, ranked very highly, where you can see things like infrastructure resiliency were a bit more mixed. But, you know, again, these were... Uh, resources that we use both in developing framework and the, developing the framework. And again, we'll be referring to these when we develop the investment programs later on this winter and spring. Next slide, please. So at this point, I'm gonna kind of go kind of element by element through the um, planning framework to show you what we've changed and talk a little bit about why. Um, you know, you can kind of follow along in the materials that I referenced earlier. And um, with that, let's go to the next slide. Um, so some of the things we did with the, the vision, the vision is generally um, very much the same um, as what we shared back in December. You know, we got some recommendations from advisory council members, how to make it a bit more concise. Um, also emphasizing kind of ease of access of reaching um, key destinations. So I'll just read the updated vision quickly here, which is that the Boston region envisions an equitable, pollution-free and modern transportation system that gets people to their destinations safely, easily and reliably, and that supports an inclusive, resilient, healthy and economically vibrant Boston region. So that's the revised text and you can see earlier versions of it um, in those comparative framework sheets uh, attached to the memo. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of our equity area, you know, one of the things we did based on um, advisory council member feedback and, and other feedback is emphasize um, facilitating inclusive and transparent planning processes rather than um, maintaining them, you know, that that kind of implies that to some degree, there's always more work that we can be doing to establish and create these processes. And you heard a lot about that at our last MPO meeting and our engagement update. But again, one, you know, to, to highlight that we may not be at the, the ideal state yet. And so facilitate implies that, you know, we're, we're continuing to work toward that. Um, we've built out our objectives related to the MPO's planning process a little bit further. Um, for example, you know, we've broken out the first two objectives with one most focused on facilitating an inclusive and transparent process with the other focused on providing people with meaningful opportunities to express uh, needs and priorities and influence decision making. Um, one of the other elements that we uh, worked on um, visually is trying to strengthen the definition of destination communities in our graphical presentation of this framework. So it's more clear because this definition definitely carries through to the other um, goals included in the planning framework. Also want to stress that we've tried to clarify some of the language here about what we're specifically talking about in terms of, um, you know, reducing the presence of harmful effects from the transportation system um, and kind of clarifying a little bit more what we mean uh, by improving outcomes for those in disadvantaged uh, communities. So really talking more about that we're providing high quality options to fully meet residents' needs. Next slide, please. Um, so in the safety goal area, you know, we've continued to maintain that um, vision zero orientation, which is very much in line uh, with what 
you know, the MPL will be working on through the Safe Streets and Roads for All um, action plan over the coming years. Um, you know, in response to member feedback and the objectives related to um, uh, fatalities, injuries, and serious uh, safety incidents, you know, focusing on eliminating rather than reducing to be better in line with that Vision Zero orientation. Um, we worked a little bit further with the, um, you know, what had been the, the, the equity objective included in this section to break it out a bit more. Um, you know, we've tried to better define and emphasize priority on vulnerable roadway users. We've worked to um, clarify the language around, um, clarify and strengthen a language around eliminating disparities for disadvantaged communities. We did remove the element talking most specifically about people in areas overburdened um, by traffic fatalities, injuries, and safety in incidents, and really wanted to put that energy instead on eliminating disparities for disadvantaged populations. Next slide, please. Uh, so for the mobility and reliability goal, um, you know, we heard from um, MPO and advisory council members that there may be, uh, you know, some variation in how people define the word mobility. So we wanted to, to make it at least a little bit more clear in uh, how we were phrasing it in the goal statement. So we've updated this to supporting easy and reliable movement of people in fright to um, you know, better clarify that def definition. Um, we've wanted to simplify some of the objectives we have around improving um, roadway uh, and transit reliability and reducing delay, um, kind of simplifying the terminology that we use there. We wanted to make sure that we had a parallel objective to the roadway one around reducing delay on the transit system, um, especially given you know, the work that the MPO is doing to support implementation of bus lanes and transit signal priority in the region. Um, as I mentioned uh, in the December presentation, this goal now encompasses a number of the system preservation and modernization themes that we had in other goal areas in our current plan, Destination 2040. You know, one of the things that we've done to kind of strengthen and emphasize elements here is um, talking about how electric vehicles are an example of the technology um, that supports the MPO's goals with respect to modernization. Next slide, please. So access and connectivity, um, in having conversations with um, MPO members and the advisory council, we heard that, you know, there is very much an interest in um, economic vitality and making sure that that's impress, uh, expressed in the MPO's planning framework in some way. Um, you know, we we didn't restore that goal area, but we really what we really wanted to do was make sure that it was clear in some of the language that we were including in the objectives. Um, so we worked to try to strengthen strengthen references to economic vitality um, in the objectives, particularly in this section. Um, one thing you'll notice in the the first objective is that we've added a reference to um, you know prioritizing uh multimodal access to key destinations and we've also kind of split this objective so that we have a second element that relates to supporting investments that advance the regions and the state's goals for housing production land use and economic growth um, and these were in response to some suggestions that we got from mpo members we've clarified our objective about um how access to transportation options should really support people's travel choices and opportunities. Um, you know, we've also reworked our objectives related to um, transportation network gaps and barriers. Um, so one of the things we've done around network gaps is really emphasize, particularly with transit, um, as evidenced by the work we do with the Transit Working Group, is really supporting interorganizational coordination to help close some of those gaps. And in talking about, um, you know, reducing barriers that people experience when using the transportation system, you know, we really wanted to emphasize, um, you know, accessibility for, for people using the system, regardless of ability, um, both here and in other parts of the MPO's planning framework. So this is one place where we've really tried to do that. You may see in other sections kind of references to how people travel and really building in references to using assistive mobility devices 
um, when we're talking about how people do that. Next slide, please. Um, so there, the revisions to the resiliency goal are relatively minor. Uh, one thing we've done here is bring in um, the objective about um, using nature-based solutions to reduce impacts on the environment into this goal area. Certainly um, applying nature-based solutions um, is, is definitely one way that we help um, advance resiliency by making our na natural environment able to help us to, do, to um, avoid you know, consequences of increased flooding and sea level rise, et cetera. Um, we've also talked a little bit more about examples of what nature-based solution means and what, you know, negative um, environmental impacts look like with some more specific language there. Next slide, please. Um, finally, we have our clean air and healthy communities goal area. This is where we talked about the mode shift and um, VMT reduction objectives that I referenced in um, the beginning of the presentation. You know, we had some conversation internally uh, as staff uh, thinking about the relationships between encouraging mode shift, VMT, reducing VMT, and reducing greenhouse gases and pollutants. And knowing that how interconnected these things are, we developed an objective that kind of combines them together and shows their linkages. Uh, one thing I'll highlight too from the surveys and discussions that we have with MPO board members that folks were kind of split on the how reducing VMT was incorporated in our goals or, and objectives. Um, one suggestion that we got was to reflect um, language in uh, that's shown in some of the Commonwealth's uh, clean energy and decarbonization plans around trying to reduce VMT growth. Um, so we've tried to incorporate some of that um, wording here as opposed to reducing VMT overall. Again, we do have the, the previous wording of the objective available in your materials. So if there's conversation uh, the MPO wants to have about the wording of that objective, you know, we can definitely dig into that. Um, we also added another objective specifically related to um, supporting electrification of the transportation system to achieve our clean air goals, you know, emphasizing you know transit electrification as part of that process. Next slide, please. Um, just some last considerations. We did ask a question about whether we should um, reorder the elements of this framework to reflect priority. Um, we kept them the same kind of based on uh, mixed feedback that we heard from folks on how to approach that. Um, the other uh, item that we did hear about when we were having conversations about this framework was around issues of cost and cost effectiveness. And I know this is an area where the MPO has been having a lot of dialogue in different committee meetings and settings and in discussions we've had around the TIP criteria. We thought that you know, some of these costs and cost control elements uh, might be expressed in best expressed in other policies that the MPO has. So we haven't um, included those elements in the framework specifically. Next slide, please. So again, um, once we have concurrence from you all in a framework, we're gonna continue to use this as a guide for developing our investment programs. Um, this will certainly shape LRTP project selection criteria, as I mentioned. It also becomes kind of an organizing principle that we can use for talking about um, material in the destination 2050 plan document, including in the needs assessment. Um, so looking out further ahead, um, of course, we'll use this for future TIP criteria updates, help to guide UPWP study selection, and also shape future performance-based planning work. Next slide, please. So this is a recap of the slide I presented at the outset about you know, some of the things we've done to update the framework and also our ask for you today, which is um, to express concurrence with uh, this framework so we can continue to advance work on Destination 2050. Thank you, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Michelle. Questions from the members? Seeing none. I assume there therefore is general consensus on all the great work that's been done to date. Bill Conroy. Yeah, I just have uh, one comment and uh, thank you for all the work, the hard work that was put into this as it relates to resiliency. And I think um, uh, 
some work needs to be done with that as you kind of conveyed to the group here uh, as uh, some people feel as though natural barriers as opposed to man-made barriers um, as it affects um, in every destination, I, I should say, or every location, I should say, as it relates to resiliency has uh, some effects, whether it's it, obviously climate change, obviously the rising tides um, affect uh, the coastal areas, but how they relate to roadways in themselves and whether we eliminate those roadways and create natural barriers, thus uh, creating a barrier or a, a location that maybe will be inaccessible for some. Um, so some things need to be looked at in, the, in that regard. Um, and I know we, the city, are looking at different ways of uh, natural barriers, that being Dade Boulevard and other, other areas within the uh, Commonwealth. So, uh, but I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you, Secretary. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Bill. Thanks. And thanks for the promotion. Um, Thank you. Oh, well, <laughs> sorry about that, David. Yeah, but, you know, well, whatever. One day, maybe. Right? <laughs> I doubt it. Any other? You never know. You never any know. Other, <laughs> any other comments? Or, <laughs> comments? <laughs> Ryan K. David, I wouldn't wish that on you, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. I think that's great. Michelle, you did a great job presenting, and you can assume we have consensus to the good work you've done. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and I, I just want to make a quick comment and, and thank you, um, Bill, for, for raising that point. I think one of the things we were thinking of, too, with the, the resiliency and the, the natural barriers is just even within kind of a corridor kind of profile, for, for lack of a better word, you know, just kind of that, that element of being cognizant to kind of where we can support, you know, natural mechanisms for stormwater drainage and things like that. So kind of thinking about the, the small scale, smaller scales with that as well as, um, and of course, working with uh, MassDOT Highway Division and other folks um, on the best ways to approach that in any given project. Thank you, Michelle. Next item on the agenda is the financial outlook for the TIP and LRTP. Ethan LaPointe, whenever you're ready. Uh, Mr. Chair, if it's okay, I, I can kick this one off and oh, sure. And close out with you. I, I Thank did. you. I didn't even see your name. Yeah, <laughs> you know, we, we went in alphabetical order. Um, and just a last comment, I, I want to thank um, not only you all, MPO members, and uh, the members of the Advisory Council um, for your support in developing the framework I just covered, but also the hard work from all, all of my staff members. There were a lot of people behind the, the recommended framework that you saw today. So I really appreciate the effort that they put into that. Um, so now to talk about um, the financial outlook for the TIP and LRTP and what you can expect for funding uh, available to program on uh, projects in the region, um, both in the near term and the longer term. Next slide, please. Uh, so um, I'm going to cover just very generally some um, inputs that go into the financial assumptions that we'll be sharing with you today. I'll talk a little bit about assumptions kind of starting with the longer term and then narrowing in on uh, the assumptions for the TIP and Ethan will cover uh, the material specific to the TIP and then we'll close out with some questions and discussion. So uh, the MPO staff receive financial assumptions um, for the TIP on an annual basis and for the LRTP every four years from um, the MassDOT Office of Transportation Planning, which you know works with a number of stakeholders in the, the Commonwealth uh, to produce those estimates, um, including the Federal Highway Administration. And they reflect uh, a couple of different things. First, they're a function of expected future of federal highway funding for Massachusetts. And this is shaped by uh, funding amounts uh, included in federal authorization bills, such as the um, bill we're under right now, the bipartisan infrastructure law, as well as assumed growth rates for how funding amounts may change over time. Um, you know, one of the things that gets factored out, um, you know, when looking at the um, available funding is planned debt repayments that the Commonwealth is going to make. Uh, these are subtracted out from federal funds. We refer to these uh, debt payments as grant anticipation notes or GANs. Um, these pay for things such as um, in the past, they've paid for the accelerated bridge program, and I think believe looking to the future, they'll be paying for the next generation bridge uh, program as well. 
um, after those GANs payments are subtracted out, there's a you know, state match provided uh, for the remaining uh, federal funding available. Next slide, please. Um, so again, after considering those, those debt payments, um, the federal funding and that state match is available for a couple different items. Uh, the first are statewide highway planning and pass-through items. Um, these cover things like interstate maintenance, bridge improvements, and of, of course, um, you know, the, the function of, you know, planning activities and the, and the work of the Office of Transportation Planning. Those encompass about two-thirds of the federal funding and state match that I'm speaking of. The remaining one third is discretionary funding for the Commonwealth's regional planning agencies. Um, Boston Region MPO receives about 43% of these dollars, and that's based on a formula that I believe accounts for population as well as a number of other factors. Next slide, please. So now I'll go in a little bit to funding over the long term um, and what you can expect for Destination 2050. Next slide, please. Um, so one thing to be cognizant of is that the first five years of the plan um, essentially is, is the tip. Um, so the, the funding assumptions uh, for the tip that you'll hear a little bit more about from Ethan uh, also apply to the LRTP, but we're also looking out um, for the, the next uh, 20 or so years beyond that. So the full period that we're looking at for destination 2050 runs from federal fiscal year 2024 through 2050. And we break this up into uh, time bands, which I'll talk a little bit more about later in the presentation. Next slide, please. So some of the factors affecting the funding we expect to have for the LRTP, um, the base federal funding uh, that the Commonwealth gets every year is, is expected to grow approximately 2% annually through, uh, dust, through 2050. These um, initial plan years, as I mentioned, are covered by the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, um, which others may know as the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. Um, you know, we have a basis of understanding of you know what the current situation looks like, but of course you know we um, the characteristics of the future federal bills that'll shape um, our transportation funding system, not only through um, the programs uh, that are available for different federal um, initiatives, but also the um, amount of funding resources available are still unknown. Um, but again, the um, Commonwealth works with FHWA and others to kind of come up with that anticipated growth rate. Um, the amount of GANs payments that are available kind of also changes over time. Um, as you know, you'll know, you hear a little bit more about from Ethan, there are no GANs debt payments um, that will are expected between federal fiscal years 2027 and 31. Uh, a new set, um, for which the amount changes a little bit from year to year will be occurring between federal fiscal years 2032 through 45. And as of right now, uh, there are no GANS payments assumed for federal fiscal years 2046 through 50, although um, you know, that may certainly change and is part of the reason why we you know, revisit long range planning every four years to account for new information and uh, you know, make updated assumptions. Next slide, please. Um, so I'm just going to do a little bit of a comparison between, you know, our, our expectations that we've had for Destination 2040, um, our current um, active plan that was adopted in 2019, and what we might be seeing looking out to uh, Destination 2050. So this chart shows um, the time bands um, for Destination 2050. We kind of look at the overall plan horizon in roughly five-year immigrant in I've been talking too long, <laughs> roughly five-year in, in increments. Um, sometimes that last time ban may encompass a couple of extra years to kind of round out that planning horizon period. But overall, uh, for Destination 2040, you know, we were looking to program approximately $2.9 billion based on uh, the funding assumptions that were made then. Uh, next slide, please. So now uh, the slide shows a chart specific to destination 2050. Um, you can see kind of the time bands that are outlined there. Uh, the time band, um, that fifth time band uh, encompasses about seven years, so it's a little bit longer than some of the others. You can see kind of the, the funding expected each of 
those time band periods. And overall, um, for the planning horizon, which is about 27 years, we're looking at um, approximately $5 billion to program over that period. And the bottom of the chart kind of shows us the um, increases time band to time band, um, if you were to kind of compare the five-year increments from destination 2040 to 2050. Um, but overall, that's um, amounting to an increase of approximately $2.1 million that we'll be thinking about over the course of this plan. Next slide, please. So this chart shows kind of the yearly values that we're expecting based on the growth rates and the other factors that I spoke of. Um, and you can see kind of how those individual years are broken up into those time bands. Um, you can see in the dark blue, some of the um, yearly amounts that are expected for the federal fiscal years 24 through 28 tip, which make up um, the first five years of the plan, and then kind of that steady growth in the green for future LRTP years. You know, in the, the TIP years, we're looking at amounts ranging from, uh, you know, 130 to a little over 150 million any given year, um, but increasing um, well above 200 million in some of the out years of the plan. Next slide, please. So I just want to highlight how these funding assumptions will affect decisions that the MPO will be making later on. Um, you may remember this diagram from my presentation last week. You know, the MPO will be focused on figuring out how to allocate these discretionary funds to its investment programs for the full period of the Destination 2050 plan. And that's represented by the yellow bar. You may recall from a review of the LRTP project programming policies that we're really focusing specific decisions about projects within those first 10 years. And, um, you know, for the years beyond, uh, you know, 2033, no specific projects will be programmed in the LRTP. Next slide, please. Um, this table uh, is designed to show kind of a, what we're trying to make <laughs> as a deliverable in terms of those decisions. You know, we have the... Um, you know, investment programs listed in the far left-hand column, and you can kind of see the amounts of funding um, in the, the blue columns further to, further to the right. And you can see in those yellow columns kind of the share of funding um, in each of those programs for any particular time band, as well as overall over the course of the plan. Next slide, please. Uh, so in terms of next steps to support, you know, this um, discretionary funding allocation decision making that you all will be doing, we'll be continuing to review and update the MPO investment programs. Um, again, I want to thank everyone who participated in the discussion we had on January 19th and, you know, appreciate any additional feedback you want to share through the survey. Um, and once we have that investment program structure in place, we'll be sizing those programs um, and selecting LRTP projects um, for those first 10 years. Next slide, please. So with that, I'll turn it over to Ethan to talk a little bit more about what you can expect for the upcoming tip. Thanks, Michelle, and good morning, everybody. So uh, just starting off on what the three major impact uh, factors are for TIP funding for the fiscal 24 to 28 cycle. Uh, starting off, uh, I'd like to actually jump to the third line item here, which Michelle has already mentioned, which is the lack of GANs repayments in federal fiscal years 2027 and 2028. Given how uh, MassDOT allocates its funding and finances there, uh, the net impact of that is that there will be an increase in the amount of regional target funding available in those years, resulting from the absence of those pavements. Uh, shortly, I will go into exactly what that looks like, but just keep that in the back of your mind for now. Uh, also, the MPO generally assumes that there is a base federal funding increase of approximately 2% in escalation per year, which explains the variances between the years. And you'll see once we get a little bit more graphical with these figures that the 24 to 26 funding estimates are consistent with what was already put forth by the bipartisan infrastructure law, also known as the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, during the development of the 23 to 27 TIP. We're also going to be looking at some additional funding in core federal programs offered by MassDOT, not necessarily impacting regional target. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, I wanted to elaborate further on some of those additional programs and details. Over the past year, since the adoption of the fiscal 23 to 27 tip, there have also been additional uh, guidance provided by the Federal Highway Administration, Federal Transit Administration, and other agencies 
that has helped to shape some of the different strategies and programs that MassDOT's been putting forth. For example, MassDOT is actively developing a strategy to fund projects within what's known as the Carbon Reduction Program using its allocation of carbon reduction formula funds, which was a new funding source provided by the bipartisan infrastructure law. In a similar vein, there's the PROTECT formula program, with PROTECT being a, a specific funding source that's dedicated more towards carbon resiliency, climate resiliency improvements. Uh, and this has also been added in MassDOT's statewide highway line item. And MassDOT is currently working to evaluate and identify eligible projects within the regions. Again, this would not be a regional target program and would instead be included in the statewide highway program, but just something to keep in mind that we'll see additional guidance as the TIP develops. We're also seeing additional funding estimates for other kinds of funding programs offered through the BIL, perhaps already included in the fiscal 23-27 TIP, that additional guidance is creating some kind of strategy changes for. For example, there's the Bridge Formula Program, which is already an integral part of the TIP, the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Program, the Ferry, Bo Ferry Boat Capital Program, and others. If we go on to the next slide, we can circle back more to focus on what's really the core of this, which is the regional target funding. This graph shows the amount of regional target funding authorized for the Boston region through 2024 and 2028, and I've also included the 2023 figures as a reference and a benchmark. The blue bars show the current amount of funding that is projected based on the current TIP, 23 to 27, whereas the orange bars illustrate any additional funding made available for the 27 and 28 years. The updated funding figures show that the expectations for funding between 24 to 26 are unchanged, with funding of 130.6, 128.4, and 125.2 million in each of those years, respectively. In 2027, the funding estimate has increased from $138.2 million in the 23 to 27 tip to $155.5 million, a nearly $17 million increase. In a similar fashion, the funding in 2028 is estimated at $158 million. Again, in this case here, this is the result largely of the absence of those GANS repayments, which is in effect provide the MPO with additional funding for regional target in those years. Moving on to the next slide, we can see this in a tabular form. So while that graph may have showed the amount of funding authorized, this helps to contrast with the amount of funding that's already been programmed in the TIP for fiscal 23 to 27. You can see the remaining balance of funding once broken out between the two at the bottom there and the green. The figures in green show basically how much money we have left in each year to program new projects as we develop the 24 to 28 TIP, but also importantly, to accommodate any changes in project readiness for projects already in the TIP. A $13.5 million balance remains in 2024, a $3.8 million in 2025, and $2.1 million remaining in 2026. With the additional funding available for 2027, there is a $26.5 million funding availability for projects there and $158 million in 2028. Because 2028 is a new year for the TIP, there are not technically any currently programmed obligations uh, against that funding figure. The key caveat here being that staff are anticipating continuing to fund any ongoing obligations that are in the 23 to 27 TIP, for example, being the Rutherford Avenue and McGrath Highway projects which currently only have a portion of their overall total federal participating cost programmed in 2027. So before I open the floor to any discussion on this, I want to highlight some key takeaways and next steps as the 24 to 28 TIP development cycle uh, spools up. We have a limited amount of regional target funding balance in fiscal years 2025 to 2026. As mentioned, there's about 3.8 and 2.5 million in each of those years. This not only limits the possibility of funding additional projects in those years, but may have an impact on changes based on project readiness. I'll have more on that in the, on the next slide as I talk about next steps and upcoming meetings. But before we get there, I think a major key consideration for the development of the current TIP and future TIPs is how we create and maintain a robust project pipeline so that we can stand ready to utilize new funding opportunities or availability. This is not a new consideration as it's emerged in prior discussions with the MPO board and in the MPO's federal certification review. But as this presentation wraps up, and before I move on to my next one on the TIP scoring process, and as the executive director will mention in their presentation on the TIP process engagement and readiness committee, it's a question that's going to be core to the discussion surrounding the TIP as we enter the spring and move beyond after the final TIP is adopted for 24 and 28. We go on to the next slide and we really look into the next steps there. 
excuse me, uh, we can start to kind of dig into what that spring is going to look like as far as what the key tasks are going to be. Right now, staff are currently continuing to gather updated cost and scheduling information through our outreach with project proponents, MassDOT personnel, including OTP, the Office of Transportation Planning, and also the highway districts and any other stakeholders involved in the project prioritization process. Staff are also currently reviewing scores for evaluated projects, more on that in a bit, and beginning to circulate draft scores to project proponents. This month, staff are going to be identifying funding needs for projects already programmed in the TIP, starting with the Boston Region's component of MassDOT's TIP readiness days, which happened on February 8th. Following that event on the 8th, I'm going to have a summary meeting gathering together all the possible changes and major updates presented there at the next MPO meeting on the 16th. Moving on, as we enter March, staff will then begin on the March 2nd meeting to present the board with scores, the final scores, I should say, for each of the projects that were evaluated, their project descriptions, overviews, maps, locations, feedback, etc., and really open the floor to a discussion around potential programming scenarios. We have the March 16th meeting dedicated to the discussion of programming scenarios for both new projects and projects that have already been funded in the TIP and may have either continuing obligations or some kind of readiness changes that may alter their programming. In mid to late April, we're intending to release the draft TIP for public review with a final endorsement of the TIP plan for the June 1st meeting. So TIP development is currently proceeding at a brisk clip and I'll have plenty more to discuss in my next presentation, but uh, I'd like to stop here and just open the floor to questions because that's all I have on finances. Thank you, Ethan. Questions for either Ethan or Michelle. Eric Barassa. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Ethan, um, thank you. This is great. Really good overview there. Um, uh, just, you know, in, in I like kind of one question um, and then maybe just like sort of a, a summary point. Um, when are we hearing about project um, readiness and cost information? Is that in February? And then in March, we get into project scenarios. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I missed that as you were going through. Sure, happy to cover that. So every year, MassDOT holds what's called the TIP readiness days, usually in early February. Okay. This year, the session of the TIP readiness days for the Boston region will be on February 8th. Okay. The next MPO board meeting after that, which is February 16th, will be the one where I provide the full overview of any projects or cost changes okay. for projects in the current TIP. So that will, there's a strong likelihood that that um, 13 and a half million or so in 24, you know, that, that number could change based on project cost increases and, and readiness and things like that. Yeah, I will mention that $13.5 million figure is also inclusive of any amendments we've had so far. But yes, there is a possibility that the results of the tip readiness days may alter that figure. Okay. Um, yeah, that, that's all I have. Thank you. Lynn Diggins. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is relates to the GANs. I mean, uh, so I take it then that we have been, uh, there's been money deducted from the spending being on the tip for um, like this, this current fiscal year, fiscal year 24, 25. And at 25 and 26, I'm sorry, 26, 27 are the first years where we don't have to pay back um, those scans? Yes. Okay. So when were those issued? So those those were issued in, during the, well, so the program was initiated during the Patrick administration. Oh, yeah. And so what the program was, was we spent non-federal aid, on bridge projects, but we committed future federal aid. And so when those bonds go to be paid back, we deduct future federal, we deduct federal aid in those years from, from MassDOT's allocation of federal aid. Oh, yeah. I was just wondering when they were issued, because I, I just don't remember hearing about them being, being issued. I mean, since, since I've been on the board, so I was wondering if I, I missed that. So, all right, you know, so no problem with it. I mean, in fact, we, we probably made out well, given that inflation rate has been pretty high lately. So, okay, thank you. Brian King. Thank you. I was also going to ask about GANs, which are my one of my favorite topics. Um, so I'm assuming the GANs in question that you just answered Len's question on, David, were related to the Accelerated Bridge Program. Yes. What are the GANs in 20 that kick in in 2029, 2030? Those are, are the next generation bridge program. So we've had GANs for three programs. 
The first issuance of GANs was for the central artery. They all got paid off long ago. Then we issued GANs for the accelerated bridge program. They will be finally paid off, I guess, in 2025, I think, I guess. And then we are currently doing under authorization that the legislature passed, I think it was last year or the year before, the next generation bridge program, which is a slightly smaller funding program than the accelerated bridge program, but for the same purposes. So the legislature is using future federal aid, depriving it to cities and towns in order to pay for bridges even though the Commonwealth has like $3 billion surplus and is giving money back to taxpayers. You don't have to answer that question. Oh, Thank good. you, Mr. I, Chairman. I is there, are there other questions? Bernie, <laughs> Bernie, thinner, Michelle? Seeing none. Thank you both very, oh wait, Brian, you got a question? I was gonna make a motion to oh. approve if you need it. Uh, I actually don't think we need a motion to approve it, but thank you, Brian. Thank you very much, guys. Next item on the agenda, I believe Ethan, you're up again to talk about tip process uh, on project scoring. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. So uh, this presentation will cover uh, what really, after covering the funding outlook for the 24-28 tip, we're now going to look more at what that funding is going to fund here. So the presentation is going to start with a brief overview of how new projects are scored for consideration of the tip. And then the number of applications that staff received for the 24 to 28 development period, the scoring criteria at a glance, additional next steps and some key upcoming dates there, more relevant to the project proponents. And then also, again, answering any questions we've got on the front of scoring. So if we go on to the next slide, we can start talking about the development timeline for the tip. And the next one after this, please. So the project scoring process formally begins after the closure of a project application window for the tip. Traditionally, this happens in late December, and this past cycle, which opened on November 15th for the core TIP programs and November 7th, 2022 for the Community Connections, closed on December 23rd, 2022. However, with the full scoring process, it really consists of a series of four types of activity that can commence as early as November as staff begin seeking updated project readiness updates from proponents and other stakeholders typically as part of the TIP universe presentation that I presented on back in um, November. The first category of activity here is the data and document collection, where staff begin to evaluate what kind of methodologies and data sets are available to evaluate projects before that application window commences. This could include new crash data sets or updated design reports resu resulting from conversations with municipalities, uh, MassDOT district staff, project proponents, and typically after a project review committee meeting from MASTA, especially in light of some of the TIP project cost policies recently implemented by the board. If we go on to the next slide, we can begin looking more into that kind of discussion-oriented activity, which is the proponent and district conversations. In order to make sure that proponents are seeking, the projects proponents are seeking funding for are approved by all relevant stakeholders, staff continue to have meetings not only with the project proponents, the municipalities, consultants, et cetera, but also MassDOT personnel to make sure that a project has readiness for programming and to ensure that the materials provided to the staff for evaluation are both complete, accurate, and up-to-date. For example, this year's staff received a project that had been scored for the 23 to 27 tip last year and also prior tip years of incorporation and programming, and it's been resubmitted again this year. However, the resubmission this year incorporates significant changes to the scope of work, and in that case, it was important not only to assess the new scope in its entirety, but also how it compared to the previous scope or other alternate projects that the town had uh, looked into. If we go on to the next slide, we can talk really about the meat of this activity, which is the internal scoring process. When there's sufficient information to begin scoring, staff begin evaluating the projects applied for in a given year against a set of criteria, which I'll get into later. This evaluation period is a collaborative effort, not only among different staff across CTPS, but also with MAPC as we discuss which projects we received applications for, and if any have some kind of broader regional significance or strategic interest uh, for the Boston region. And then finally, going on to the next slide, and really last but not least, is the score verification process. Once a project receives a score from staff, we really treat that as a draft score with the knowledge that sometimes our criteria isn't necessarily comprehensive. We review this draft score again through the staff to make sure that that draft score reflects the application, no details were overlooked, 
but also critically, we reach out to external stakeholders like MassDOT and also the applicants themselves to make sure no factors were overlooked and to allow applicants to provide feedback on the scoring process and any other kinds of elements before final scores are presented to the MPO. This could also include, for example, giving applicants extra time to cultivate letters of support or any additional local nuances that may have emerged in the months between application submission and that final score. In this case, the final score being presented on March 2nd at that MPO meeting. So moving on to the next slide, I'm going to start talking about the TIP project scoring criteria. But before we get in there, I'd like to talk about the total number of projects received for the TIP uh, applications by TIP cycle. So I wanted to provide really a brief overview of what the application period for 24 to 28 looked like. This year, there were 19 projects scored by staff for the 24 to 28 TIP. This is down from 25 scored projects for the 23 to 27 TIP. But in contrast to last year, uh, there were 16 new projects applied for this year, with one returning project, with that one with key differences in the scope of work, and then two projects that were new to the TIP in this cycle, but needed some additional information before they could be considered complete applications. Uh, since this was initially written, one of those has actually completed it, but just for point of order, you can see the new projects shown in the dark blue there, orange for returning projects, and I've highlighted light blue for the pending projects. Uh, and as you can see, we actually have more new ones this year compared to last year. Last year, there were 25 projects scored, 10 of the 25 were new projects, and the remaining 15 were returning projects. Going on to the next slide, I wanted to break this out a little bit between the investment programs. So for distribution, and again, a comparison to previous years, the difference in overall project scored was really driven by the investment programs outside of community connections. Four applications were submitted for complete streets, one for intersection improvements, and one for bicycle network and pedestrian connections. Of those two pending projects I mentioned earlier, one was for complete streets and the other was for bicycle network and pedestrian connections. There were 11 for the community connections programs, which is the same amount of community connections pr projects as applied for last year. Last year, staff received applications for 11 community connections projects, but also eight for complete streets, uh, two for major infrastructure, two for bike and pedestrian, and two for pedestrian improvements. Uh, if we go on to the next slide, you can actually see this broken out visually. So for a distribution, you can really kind of see here what happened. One of the main key changes here is the reduction in complete streets applications, and also the fact that there are no major infrastructure applications applied for for the 24 to 28 tip cycle here. So if we go on to the next slide, uh, I think this slide might be a little bit redundant with the next one. So let's jump to the next. It's a little bit more graphical and like this. Uh, so scoring criteria for non-community connections projects uh, directly reflect the MPO's vision goals and objectives. The six categories of criteria, I'm using just the complete street scoring framework here as a point of reference, are uh, safety, which is evaluated on the extent to which a project improves safety for all users of the roadway by evaluating existing conditions using several years of crash data, and also by evaluating the efficacy of a proposed improvements for example, being curb extensions. We also prioritize projects that address statewide tough crash locations, including specific zones with high crash rates or crashes involving vulnerable users like pedestrians and cyclists. And staff also pr uh, prioritize projects in municipalities that have adopted a vision zero approach towards eliminating traffic fatalities in their communities. System preservation and modernization, which is the next goal area, not only ensures that assets remain and maintain a state of good repair, but that projects modernize the transportation system and critically ensure that the assets will address any potential uses and hazards or capacity needs that they may face throughout their useful life. This also means evaluating capacity management and mobility, the third criteria, uh, which is where we take how we take an existing asset like a road or a bridge and make it fully accessible and safe to use for a variety of transportation modes, such as transit, to efficiently use the current road footprint. Efficient and multimodal travel, in turn, contribute to the fourth criteria of clean air and sustainable communities. And the fourth criteria is really there to further an environmentally friendly transportation system, to make sure that that system works for everybody and provides comparable benefits to all. Uh, we have the transportation equity criteria. And last but certainly not least here is the economic vitality criteria, which makes sure that the project works for everybody in the region and contributes to the movement of people and goods to places to ensure a robust economic framework. 
On the next slide, I'll go into the community connections criteria, which is really its own related but different set of criteria, consistent with its primary objective being the provision of first and last mile transportation solutions that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. To make these first and last mile connections, the extent to which a project provides network connectivity is evaluated based on its proximity to activity hubs, targeted development sites, transit access, and then other transportation modes. In order to ensure that this project connects between modes and these connections are made effectively, community connections projects are then scored based on the extent to which an applicant has collaborated with or is cooperating with other entities, such as transit providers for its shuttles, or in the case of transit signal priority projects, the MBTA. We also look into how these applicants are perhaps co uh, cooperating and collaborating with local nonprofits or private companies for bicycle rack siting. The logic behind ensuring this collaboration is making sure that community connections projects fit within the broader needs of the community in Boston region, which then ties into the third criteria, where we evaluate whether or not an investment can be found in a local comprehensive plan, the needs assessment for the LRTP, or other plans that organizations like MAPC develop. Just as with other TIP categories, there's a key emphasis here on transportation equity, but with an additional focus on providing connections for individuals who could not otherwise travel somewhere without access to an automobile. And this is the mode shift category. And then finally, community connections includes a criteria that evaluates the anticipated usage of these investments and the itemization of anticipated costs through a budget worksheet to help determine the efficacy of this suspense and the fiscal sustainability of these kinds of investments. With that, if we move on to the next steps, I can again kind of review just what's going on in March for the TIP as we move into not only the meetings for this month, but also the next. Uh, so as mentioned previously, at the next MPO meeting on February 16th, I'm going to be talking about projects already programmed in the TIP, 23 to 27, based on the outcomes of TIP readiness days on February 8th. On March 2nd, I'm gonna talk about these final project scores to see not only how the applications that were sent in this year performed, but also to give applicants and proponents some time to also evaluate them and really begin thinking about the project scenario and programming process. That'll feed into the March 16th MPO meeting where we'll start talking about draft funding scenarios, strategies, objectives, and potential projects and continuing obligations we may want to program. So as we arrive in mid-March, the TIP is really going to start formally taking shape so stay tuned for more, be happy to share. And with that, I'd like to open the floor to questions. Thank you, Ethan. Are there questions from the members? Any questions or comments? Seeing none, thank you for the update, Ethan. Very well done. Next item on the agenda is the Process Engagement and Readiness Committee proposal. Hagen Tyke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. How do I sound? I switched uh, my Bluetooth speakers. You sound fine. We can hear you. Great. Great. Thank you. All right. Hello again, everybody. Um, <clears throat> I'm Tegan Tyke. I'm the executive director to the staff of the Boston Region MPO. And as I mentioned earlier in my executive director's report, I am presenting to you today a concept for a new MPO committee that could be established, um, if you choose, alongside the administration of finance, UPWP, and congestion management process committees that already exist for the MPO. Um, the, if you could go to the next slide, please. The idea for this committee um, stems from discussions by the administration of finance or ANF committee members about the MPO operations plan. Um, that's been ongoing, and in discussion of the work of the MPO in general, the ANF committee members asked staff to develop a memo, which was posted for this meeting, to describe a concept for a possible new standing committee. And they asked us to present this concept at the full board for your discussion. So that's why I am here today that um, to summarize this concept for you for your consideration and discussion, and I hope that you'll either um, as an outcome today, either vote to incorporate this concept into the operations plan as a standing committee, or if not, perhaps discuss and suggest alternatives to increasing engagement and conversations around the TIP, if you feel that that is necessary. So next slide, please. The committee being pros, proposed for consideration, which is tentatively titled the TIP Process Engagement and Readiness Committee, because it kind of tries to capture um, the things, all the things it's trying to accomplish. It's envisioned to serve several purposes to supplement the MPO board's work related to the TIP. Um, and that is um, the, the TIP, of course, is the process to identify the federally funded projects in the region. 
So the intent would be to increase participation in that process, um, to provide a forum for more for additional opportunities for board members to engage with stakeholders in the region, um, and to, um, in general, just sort of provide deeper forums for discussion. So <clears throat> these additional opportunities for engagement and discussion could be identified through the process that this would engage in um, educating the committee members um, and empowering, we hope, you to gather more insights to also then share with your potential, the potential project opponents that you interact with. So as for a caveat for this committee, the, um, the a &F committee members were generally in agreement that this TIP related committee should not duplicate or unnecessarily complicate the work that's already done at the full board level about the TIP. Um, rather, it should be providing an additional forum for supplemental and deeper discussions and input into the TIP process. And in addition, there was general agreement with the ANF committee that this committee should not be expected to feed specific recommendations up to the board level, such as how, for example, the UPWP committee does now, where it recommends the UPWP be approved by the board, including the slate of discrete studies to be approved by the board. So the model would not be the same as the UPWP committee. Next slide, please. Great. So with that context in mind, um, the draft charge of this committee in the memo is proposed to be to review and explore how to improve the TIP process, as well as to increase collaboration and engagement of key stakeholders involved in the process, including board members, MathDOT, um, MBTA, RTAs, and any other project proponents. And the target members of the committee would likely be more focused on sub-regional and municipal board members, but would also benefit from the collaboration of other key representatives from regional and state um, agencies. So in order to give you a clearer sense of what the committee could do, or a more specific sense, um, we offer some sample activities in the memo for your consideration, and I'll touch on these in these next two slides. Thank you for changing it. So the first example, the committee could perform an annual deeper dive into the TIP criteria, which you just discussed today. Um, doing so would provide an opportunity for the board members, for you all to be um, both, um, if, whether or not you already feel familiar or whether you're unfamiliar with those TIP criteria, to further engage in and educate um, yourselves about how they're applied and what they accomplish relative to the MPO goals and priorities. The um, committee members could also discuss whether they believe that the criteria continue to meet regional and local needs. And if um, they felt concerned that they did not, they could suggest to the full board to consider whether to contemplate an update to the criteria. Um, the second um, uh, piece of the slide is another deeper dive activity could be oriented towards the scoring process itself and the results um, as that occurs. So um, we talked about next talking about scores for the projects. We could um, the committee members could discuss not just the current process, but also look at overarching trends um, over the years that might help further identify barriers to entry into the process that are related to the scoring itself and the structure of the scoring. And then the committee member could leverage those conversations and insights to help project proponents better understand and participate in the TIP process. Next slide, please. Another sample activity could be to provide supplemental input into the scenario development process. Um, the board is heavily engaged in that scenario development, but if feasible, given the board and the TIP schedule, the input of the committee could include offering interim feedback to staff um, as they're creating and evolving the funding scenarios, or if it doesn't allow for that, it could um, engage this committee in discussing how the scenarios as they were developed, um, how well they address regional priorities to inform the process and future um, tip cycles. And then a last example I'll mention here, there's a bit more in the memo um, of some activities, would be to continue the conversations that I alluded to also in the executive director's report um, that began or, or were, I guess, fleshed out a bit more in the tip ad hoc cost and readiness committee. And that committee itself left some topics open for additional conversation. So this committee could build on those conversations. Um, it could build on the recommendations that we saw in the federal certification review report, and it could consider how to improve the project pipeline based on, based on those considerations. Um, the committee could also work to better understand the causes of the cost and readiness challenges for, for different types of projects and help identify strategies to really just better support the success of projects um, through the TIP process and with their completion within schedule and budget. So the next slide, please. So we developed a sample timeline that's also in the memo to help illuminate um, a reasonable number of meetings that this committee could have and how it would be supplemental to the full policy board's process that you engage in. 
So the top of this timeline, it includes in, in blue, includes sort of major tip milestones relative to the board activities. And the bottom could be in the brownish orange color, parallel committee meetings that would supplement that process. So just to provide some examples walking through this, um, early in the tip cycle, you know, around this time, really actually before this time, the committee could carry out um, an early kickoff and review the existing universe of projects. Um, that could happen um, around or before when we actually do the TIP how-to meetings and before we present the universe of the TIP projects to the board. Then after that occurs in December, um, as you see on the timeline, the committee could have to could take that deeper dive into the current TIP criteria and the process of scoring projects before that exercise is fully underway and then concluded. Then after it's concluded in, for example, February, the committee could um, provide additional an additional forum at that point for a deeper dive into those scoring results that we'll be discussing soon. Um, even beginning to discuss what scenarios might be interesting for staff to consider to um, explore with the policy board. And then later around April, after the project readiness and programming scenarios are initially presented to the board, the committee could continue to provide a forum for the deeper exploration of the challenges and issues that have been identified through that um, to that reporting to the board. And then finally, after the TIP is endorsed, the committee could debrief and consider process improvements um, for the coming year. And then, of course, as is noted at the very bottom of the slide, there could be ongoing, you know, ad hoc or regular meetings of the committee to discuss in general project readiness updates and recurring themes and challenges that are identified. So next and last slide, please. So um, as I mentioned, you know, we had a goal for today um, for you to discuss and decide whether you liked this proposal coming out of the ANS committee. Um, some questions for your discussion might be whether or not you agree with the needs that we discussed here driving the intent to establish a committee um, around increasing participation, um, providing additional forums for conversation and more opportunities for board members to engage stakeholders. You could also discuss whether the sample activities um, that we described in the memo seem like the right ones or if we missed any potential activities. And you could discuss whether you feel that this concept does in fact accomplish the overall goal that I stated um, that this would supplement rather than duplicate work done at a full policy, full policy board level. So with that, I'd like to turn it back to you, Mr. Chair, and open up to the um, ANF committee members also if they would like to discuss this concept a bit and um, make any statements around it. And, if we can determine whether the board is in support, um, that would be excellent. Thanks, Mr. Chair. You're welcome, thank you, thank you. Comments, questions, suggestions, ideas, anybody? Brian King. Thank you, David, and thank you, Tegan. Well well said. Um, <clears throat> so the, I, I, I liken this really to, uh, to a technical committee, sort of, and, and I come back to, when we were doing the last tip cycle, I don't know if folks remember, um, we, we had a couple of instances where the towns weren't ready to go. And last minute sort of take them out and, and, and substitute things had to come in. And this was at the topic of the ad hoc committee, so I don't want to repeat myself, but there, <clears throat> we, we, we always find ourselves kind of taking having mass dot come to us and say they're not ready they they got to go out and then there's kind of this mad scramble i think what what this committee would do is not play the role of deciding what gets put in place but hearing out on a technical basis why projects are or are not ready to go and then making a recommendation to the mpo <clears throat> on that basis and in really having that level of discussion and and you know we went through this with 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 bedford trust me i remember um and, and, and many others and i think it would have been helpful then to have had a venue other than this large 21 person board or whatever the number is to to have those more technical and and back and forth discussions with with staff or with proponents or or with mass dot around project readiness so that to me is what this is is all about. It's not about deciding what gets money and what doesn't. It, it's really much narrower. Um, and it would allow, I believe, <clears throat> cities and towns to have uh, to be able to ask more and better questions or even advocate if if they so choose for their projects to stay in or stay out based on, 
you know, what, what they're technically hearing. So I, I think this is a good idea and I think it would improve the process. And I think it would allow the MPO board itself to have less busy tip meetings when we get to April every year, because a lot of the sort of legwork, technical work will have been done in, in committee. So thank you, David. Thank you, Brian. Tom O'Rourke. Thank you, David. Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with Brian. I, I, think, uh, I think this does make sense. I think it's a more proactive approach to engaging uh, some of the communities we work with and the projects that we deal with uh, and will allow us to identify issues uh, hopefully earlier and, and, and solve them uh, in, in a good way. So I, I would support this. Thank you, Tom. Diggins. Thanks for sharing with me. I don't know if this is the time that we would discuss some details about the nature of the committee, but but one thing is that I, I, I would be in favor of anyone who wants to be a part of the committee um, to be a part of the committee, you know, uh, and and if we are talking about in potential timelines, I, mean, I do have a question about I me mean, that last potential last meeting and whether it should be, you know, after the approval of the tip or maybe a couple of weeks beforehand so that we could process public comments, you know, more perhaps it's public comments before we actually finalize the tip. I mean, but that could be something we discuss later if we decide to implement this committee. Thank you. Other questions or comments? David Kozis. Okay, so so I'm, I mean, I'm not sure how much this new committee would duplicate work or how much it would help push, you know, understanding forward. It, it does seem like a big commitment to create a new committee, but it could be worth it. So I, I'm not sure. I, I just wonder if there's ever been a thought of doing a trial. Like we love doing trials in Newton, you know. I you know, what would happen if we just decided to start a new committee for a year or two and then decide a year later, have a discussion about it, see if it's been effective, it's been helpful, and then decide if we want to make it a permanent committee. That's just a thought. David, other comments? So, Tegan, do you have what you need from us? I think what we'd like to know is, does the board want to move to specifically include this as a committee going forward, if you feel like that needs a vote, Mr. Chair? Um, and if you don't feel like it needs a vote, then I, what we've heard is more in the positive, so we could move forward with working to kick off a committee like this. But we would like to, if it's a standing committee, we'd like it to be documented in the operations plan that can always be amended and removed. It does not need to stay forever. The operations plan is much more easily updated on a frequent basis. So if the board would like to indicate whether you'd like us to put it in the operations plan and move forward, that would be helpful. Eric Barassa. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to clarify what I thought was the process technically we talked about in a and was that this, is, this has been a part of the operations plan discussion. We felt that this was something we wanted to get guidance from from the full MPO board to then incorporate into the operations plan, which we will bring to the full board at some points in the next couple months. And then assuming we get approval of that, this then would be implemented like next year. I hear you. That makes sense, Eric. Thanks. Other comments or questions? Seeing none, taken. I think you can assume that you can, for purposes of discussion, put it in the operations plan. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other member items that come before the MPO today? Seeing and hearing none. Can I get a motion? In this? Oh, Brian Kane, do you have one or are you making a motion? Move to adjourn. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion has been made and seconded. Without objection, we are adjourned. Thank you all very much. See you on the 16th. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.